Hello, everyone, and happy rainy Tuesday. I'm Martel Teasley, Dean of the College of Social Work at the University of Utah mm -hmm. and Associate Provost of the University of Utah. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the first presentation in the 2021-2022 Grand Challenges for Social Work ser series, exploring the impact of gender-based violence on sexual and gender minority women, information for practitioners. For those unfamiliar with the ideal of the Grand Challenges for Social Work, they are a call to action for our researchers and practitioners to harness Social Work's science and knowledge base, collaborate with individuals, community-based organizations, and professionals from all fields and disciplines, and to work together to tackle some of our toughest social problems. As you We'll learn from today's presentation, gender-based violence, particularly within sexual and gender minority women, has become a pressing social challenge facing our nation today. It is fitting that we take a look at these issues as part of our Grand Challenge series. Before we begin today's presentation, on behalf of the College of Social Work, I am proud to recognize the contributions of our American Indian community members by acknowledging that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Gochi, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationships that exist between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities to research, education, and community outreach activities. We are also an anti-racist cause of social work, and we pledge to engage in anti-racist practices through our research, education, and community-based activities. Now, a 90-minute event will proceed as follows. We will hear from the College of Social Work faculty member, Dr. Charlie Harrier ellis about his research in this area. He will be joined by co-presenters, Dr. Karen Frost, Dr. Lisa Gein, and PhD student, Bobby Yance. Following the presentation, Dr. Hoy ellis will lead a discussion with the other presenters. Dr. Hoy ellis Hoya Ellis looks forward to your questions at that time. So let's get started. Dr. Charlie, Charlie Hoya Ellis is an assistant professor here at the College of Social Work. He earned both his MSW and PhD from the University of Washington, where he completed his dissertation project on the mental health of LGBTQ plus adults. He joined the College of Social Work in, in 2015 and has continued his research on the well being of the midlife and aging of LGBTQ populations. The overarching goal of his research is to help understand and address the social determinants that led to health or that lead to health disparities and to ultimately work towards health equity among marginalized populations. He is a co investigator with the Aging with Pride National Health, Aging and Sexuality Gender Study and a Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program Fellow at the University of Utah's College of Nursing. Dr. Hoy Ellis' research has been recognized both nationally and internationally, and he continues to advocate for the well-being of the LGBTQ plus community. Welcome, Dr. Hoya Ellis and co-presenters. Please take it away. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Dr. Teasley, I appreciate it. Uh, before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to welcome our guests, allow them each a few moments to introduce themselves and their connections to this field. We'll start with Dr. Karen Frost, who is the Associate Director of the MSW program here at the College of Social Work. Dr. Frost, please take a moment to introduce yourself. Great, thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, my name is Karen Frost. I'm a research professor in the College of Social Work. 
Um, I've been in the College of Social Work for um, 20, almost 21 years, kind of scary. Um, anyway, so my connection to this research is um, we had written a seed grant working with Dr. Hoy Ellis, Dr. Grin, and Mr. Yance, um, as well as one of our master students, and we had gotten funding, and you'll see some of the um, information from that funding in here, but I'm also part of the Center of Excellence for Women's Health here at the University of Utah, and in that capacity, this, this type of work and these types of discussions are incredibly important and informative. So thank you for having me, and I'm excited to um, talk to you today. Thank you, Dr. Frost. Next is Dr. Lisa Grin, an associate professor in the U of U Division of Public Health. Dr. Grin, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Charlie. It's nice to be here today. My interest in this research really stems from my public health background, where um, I work to connect communities with clinical care systems. Um, by doing community engaged research. And so we're excited to present some of that work today. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Grin. Finally, we have Bobby Yancey, a PhD student here in the College of Social Work. Bobby, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Dr. Hoyelis. Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, my name is Bobby Yance, and I'm a third year doctoral student here at the University of Utah College of Social Work. Um, my research interests specifically have been around LGBTQ plus um, health disparities, as well as intimate partner violence specific. And I've had the opportunity to have Dr. Jorge Ellis as my mentor in the doctoral program, and also uh, been very honored to work alongside and collaborate with Dr. Uh, Frost and Dr. Grin. And I'm really excited to go over our findings and implications for practice today. Thank you, Bobby. Um, before we get started, I also wanna take a moment to call out Diana Powell. She's been an integral part of our research team. And the only reason that Diana is not here today to be part of our presentation is that after graduating from our MSW program this past May, uh, a very insightful agency offered her a full-time paid position. And she had kept several clients scheduled today and she thought it was more important. And I totally agreed that um, uh, her client's well-being takes precedence over uh, presenting research. But again, I do want to reiterate, um, Diana has been volunteering with us before she even started the program and continues to volunteer with us after completing her program. So thanks, Diana. And so now I am going to go into our presentation. If I can operate the buttons correctly. So today we'll be talking about some of our findings from uh, our study that uh, Dr. Frost talked about. So we'll be exploring the impact of gender-based violence on sexual and gender minority women uh, with a focus on information for practitioners. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for being here today. I also wanna thank Andrew Wyrick, Vice President for Research. So uh, this grant was funded under the 1U4U Vice President for Research Interdisciplinary C Grant Program, the 2019-2020 cycle. Uh, the title of our project was Viol Violence Against Sexual and Gender Minority Women, a Mixed Methods Consideration of One College uh, uh, Experience. I also want to acknowledge that October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and there's a lot going on at the U as well as in the uh, larger community. So um, I think it's very important that we recognize this. So what our objectives are for today uh, is to articulate the grand challenge of building healthy relationships to end violence. So this is uh, the grand challenges for social work. Uh, uh, elucidates 11, I believe it's 11 distinct grand challenges uh, to better improve the human condition. And so we are focusing specifically on building healthy relationships to end violence. What we hope to do is demonstrate how heterosexist and cis-normative bias in social work practice uh, can cause challenges for sexual and gender minority women uh, in general, as well as those who have been targeted for gender-based violence. We also want to uh, present some, under, some risk factors unique to gender-based violence and sexual and gender minority women, 
and to identify strategies for best, best practices in working with individuals, organizations, and communities. So this is the grand challenge, uh, building healthy relationships to uh, end violence. Interpersonal violence has a traumatizing impact across the lifespan on individuals, families, communities, and society. Oppression based on factors such a person's age, race, gender, identities, abilities, or socioeconomic status alter these experiences. Healthy relationships foster emotional resilience and strength. Developing and broadly implementing inter interventions, both universal and targeted with individual relationship, community, and service delivery systems can bolster a range of interpersonal relationships, reduce violence more broadly, and strengthen our mental and physical health, our families, and our communities. So what is gender-based violence? Well, gender-based violence is violence directed at an individual based on their biological sex or gender identity. It includes physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, and psychological abuse, threats, coercion, and economic or educational deprivation, whether occurring in public or private life. The National Institutes of Health in 2016 uh, put forth a definition of sexual and gender minority populations. And uh, then in 2019, they expanded that definition. So this is the current definition uh, from the NIH. So sexual and gender minority populations include, but are not limited to individuals who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, asexual, transgender, two-spirit, queer, and or intersex. Individuals with same sex or gender attractions or behaviors, and those with a difference in sex development are also included. These populations also encompass those who do not self-identify with one of these terms, but whose sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, or reproductive development is characterized by non-binary con non constructs of sexual orientation, gender, and or sex. So a sex gender perspective in research, it increases the rigor of the research and promotes discovery. It expands the relevance of biomedical research. Without careful methodology, the pursuit of sex and gender difference research will result in a literature of contradiction. Gender roles, gender identity, gender relations, and institutionalized gender influence the way in which an implementation strategy works, for whom, under what circumstances, and why. There is emerging evidence that program theories may operate differently within and across sexes, genders, and other intersectional characteristics under various circumstances. Asking critical questions about sex and gender can improve health outcomes and reduce gender inequities. Uh, so really quickly, I'm sure most, if not all of you are already aware of this, um, we tend to interchange, use, uh, use interchangeably the term sex and gender. Sex is basically our biology. It's based on our reproductive systems, our uh, genetics, our chromosomal array. Um, gender is cultural, political, and legal expectations and restrictions about what people can and cannot be or should and should not be based on their assigned biological sex at birth. So gender expression is how we communicate our gender. Our gender identity is our deepest psychological sense of ourself as a gendered being. This also has, um, is important for understanding intersectionality. So this was first described by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, it considers how systems of power overlap to continue marginalization of populations who have less power. It identifies how factors combine to discriminate against populations, especially in terms of gender and race. It's considered a lens to see how various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. Connected to how history, context, or social identity are used to shape people within systems and institutional settings. Um, 
just a quick historical footnote. Uh, in her legal brief in 1981, Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw uh, was addressing a lawsuit bought, brought by an African-American woman against her employer. And she was claiming discrimination based on both sex and race. And uh, the judge ruled against her and Crenshaw filed uh, a brief saying that you can't really disentangle discrimination based on gender and uh, discrimination based on race since the woman in question was experiencing both simultaneously. So the more marginalized um, social identities a person lives with, uh, the more likely they are to experience more varied and more severe types of discrimination, victimization, and things like that. So we know that globally, one in three women and girls will experience gender-based violence at some point in their life. Uh, looking specifically at US college students, um, and in this particular context, women. Uh, so it is important to recognize that men and boys also experience gender-based violence, but not to the uh, extent that women do. So among US college students who are women, 26% of undergrads will experience sexual assault or rape, and 10% of graduate students will experience sexual assault or rape. And so this does not um, contain, this does not include other types of gender-based violence. So emotional abuse, psychological abuse, economic abuse, things like that. There is very preliminary evidence that sexual and gender minority women, uh, for example, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender women, overall experience three times greater risk for gender-based violence than heterosexual women. Bisexual women in particular experience about two and a half times greater risk for experiencing gender-based violence compared to their heterosexual uh, counterparts. A lot of this, uh, one thing that differentiates um, sexual and gender minorities, women's experiences from heterosexual women writ largely, and I'm only focusing on one specific aspect of intersectional identities here, and that's uh, gender identities and sexual identities. Uh, so although women have multiple intersectional identities, we're focusing specifically on these today. So heterosex heterocentrism <clears throat> is an ideology that says that heterosexual cisgender uh, expressions of human sexuality are the only normal and natural forms of human sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Heterosexism is a system. So it's the structural uh, systems that operate to enforce ideology. So these systems include social stigma, exclusion, legal, political, cultural, and economic. And then uh, the term has historically used has been homophobia. So this is the interpersonal microaggressions, discrimination, victimization, and abuse. Uh, I personally no longer use the term homophobia. When it was first uh, put out into the research blogosphere back in 1972, I believe it was. Um, it was based on the definition of a phobia, which is uh, an unnatural and over the top fear of something. But if we think about the way that sexual identities and gender identities are socialized in Western cultures, um, people are actually socialized to fear lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or sexual and gender minority people. And so in, from that particular perspective, it's not an abnormal phobia, like fear of spiders or something like that. It's something that's learned. So I use individualized heterosexism. And now I am going to turn this over to Dr. Karen Frost. Thank you, Dr. Hoy Ellis. Um, oh, you have to keep sharing. Okay. <laughs> you tell yes. me when you click, right? Okay. Yes. If you do that, then we'll just, I think that's just easier. <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> I was oh. like, no, no, where did my slide go? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that there are 
you know, two or three different models that we've talked about in this presentation. And here's one that um, our own Dr. Hoy Ellis helped to co-create, which is the health equity promotion model, and it's called the HEPM. Um, and what this does for us is it really looks at the different social positions that people might hold in relationship, not only to one another and to themselves, but also to um, institutions and structures um, and systems, okay? Um, and these different, like what we have over on the left, the multi-level um, context with the, the structural levels as well as with the individual levels, they have an impact on the different adverse or health promoting pathways that people experience as they're moving through their lives, okay? So you'll see on the bottom, there's the life course. So it opens people up for risks and or for opportunities which means that if there are risks, it depends on how you get to handle them, how you are allowed to handle them, and what kinds of systems are in place to help you handle them, all right? And when these systems aren't in place for you, then you will probably go down or have an adverse um, pathway that won't be very health promoting. So then when you get to the very end over here on the right, well, it's right to me, it probably is to you too, um, but in terms of health, and then it will dictate whether or not you are going to be physically healthy or emotionally healthy. Um, and what does that look like for you? So all of these things um, together really have a, an impact on whether or not there's equity for people as they are um, moving through their, their, their life course, but also in terms of their physical and their emotional health. So Charlie, since you helped create this model, did I do it justice? Was there something else you wanted to say about this? You did it better than I ever have, Karen. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I do just want to point out that um, if you look, uh, so there's both structural and individual levels. And at the individual level, uh, abuse is one of the risk factors uh, that uh, in these adverse and health promoting pathways mediate and moderate uh, social experiences and health outcomes. So thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. All right, so one of the things that um, we need to consider is where are we as individuals, as well as where are we in our systems um, in terms of health or, or in terms of gender equity, okay? So you can see on one side, there's the gender inequity, right? And on the other side, there's gender equity. So we have the different approaches across the top. So if we're looking at, for example, gender blind, let's just move to the second one. What the features are is that people really ignore gender norms, okay? So this would be akin to somebody saying something like, um, oh, I'm blind to gender, okay? We are not, all right? So what does that mean for us um, when we are thinking about people, all right? how to interact with them, and what kind of um, integrative types of activities and interventions that we need to be thinking about for people. So what we are all hoping, I think, and I hope we're all hoping this, is that we will move over in a concerted and planned way um, to think about being gender transformative, all right? And gender transformative really means that we are considering and addressing the causes of gender-based health inequities, and we are working to transform harmful gender roles, norms, and relationships so that we can really work together in terms of, in the context of being, um, uh, of having gender equity. So anyway, we, our, our team really loves this graphic because it moves you through that whole process. And I think as individuals, we can see where we are, but we can also see where systems are in this continuum of approaches. Okay, so when we look at these graphics figures, <clears throat> one of the things that we see here is there really is the heterosexist or the cis normative bias in how we're thinking about gender-based violence um, and actually um, interpersonal violence, if that's what we would call it, domestic violence. So what we see here are, these are very, very um, male, female, man, woman kinds of, of images, right? Um, and there's not a lot of space in here. In fact, there's no space in these images for thinking about sexual and gender minorities and where they fit in this conversation. So um, anyway, yes, so I'm just gonna leave that. All right, so Charlie did this fantastic search um, on the internet and of about 364 images, and he did say in his email to the team, and I did count them, 
that there was only really one image that even talked about in the context of gender-based violence, what it means for um, 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 looking at sexual and gender minorities, looking at um, you know bisexuality, um, lesbian, gay, gay sexuality, all of these kinds of things. This is not, this is, it, this is the only image there was, which is just stunning to me. So we just thought we'd put this out there so that you could see um, that it's not really an image that's out there and people aren't really thinking about this in this in a concerted way. All right, so when we think about sexual and gender minority women's risk for being targeted for gender-based violence, a lot of what um, happens is that it's linked to cis men's beliefs about what women should be, okay? And at the bottom here, what you see is focus group participants. We had talked to um, women in the community and women on campus, okay? These are people who identify as women, all right? Um, about what happened to them. What was, did they, had they ever experienced gender-based violence? What did that mean? What were they told? And this, these three comments came out not just in one space, but in two or three spaces, okay? Still the perception that you, you, are, um, you are not a cisgender, right? You are not, you are not a, a heterosexual because you just haven't found the right man, right? So these kinds of things. And also one of our uh, participants really said, we're gonna rape you until you become straight, okay? So um, these, these kinds of, um, I wouldn't even say they're conversations, they're threats and intimidations and they're, they're emotional um, gender-based violence actions against, pe against people who identify as women if you are in the sexual and gender minority community. And these, I think we should all find very, very troubling and very problematic. So, okay, and then this is our transition slide. <laughs> yeah, so, um... Benjamin Disraeli said there's lies, damn lies in statistics. This has also been attributed to Mark Twain. Uh, maybe it's a research project out there for someone to find out. So now Bobby Yancey is going to take over. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Hoy Ellis. So as researchers, of course, we wanted to conceptualize this and see how sexual and gender minority women in Utah specifically experience gender-based violence. So we turned to statistics, right? So um, here we have the results of a secondary data analysis that we conducted um, using unpublished 2016 Utah Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System data, which is a mouthful, so we call it BRFIS data for short. So um, BRFIS is a national uh, health-related telephone survey that, survey that was actually established in 1984, I believe by the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that collects state-based uh, state data about US residents um, regarding their health-related risk behaviors, chronic health conditions, and prevention service utilization. So we decided to use the 2016 BRFIS data set because specifically, they don't always ask us, but th this year they did ask two specific questions around gender-based violence, and they also um, assessed for sexual orientation. So it was very um, relevant for our interest. So here, what we've done is for both of these questions, we've provided the statistically significant odds ratios, which I'm going to interpret for you briefly. So um, the top table, what this shows is that um, <laughs> women in Utah who identified as lesbian or gay in 2016 were 3.32 times more likely to experience unwanted sex over their lifetime compared to heterosexual or straight women. Um, additionally, we found that women in Utah who identified as bisexual in 2016 um, staggeringly were 6.03 times more likely to experience unwanted sex over their lifetime compared to heterosexual or straight women. Um, then moving to the second table, we see that women in Utah who identified as lesbian or gay were two times more likely to report being the target of domestic violence in the last 12 months compared to straight or heterosexual women. And then additionally, we found that women in Utah who identified as bisexual in 2016 also um, reported uh, or were 2.87 times more likely to experience 
domestic violence over the last 12 months compared to their heterosexual counterparts. So what these findings um, indicate is similar to existing research is that sexual and gender minorities uh, possibly do experience gender-based violence at disproportionate rates. All right, so um, next we actually wanted to narrow our focus even further to really see what gender-based violence looked like for um, sexual gender minority women at the University of Utah. And thanks to funding from the VPR targeted C grant, we were able to actually develop and distribute a campus-wide survey here at the University of Utah in the fall of 2020, so from September to December. Um, and our aim was to really explore, once again, how sexual gender minority women at the U of U experience gender-based violence. So here we have the preliminary findings. So at the top, you'll see that we gave you our sample size according to um, sexual orientation. Unfortunately, we do need to acknowledge some of the limitations, one of which was small sample size. Therefore, these findings really do only speak to how sexual and gender minority women who identify as either heterosexual or bisexual experience gender-based violence in the university context. Um, also, we wanted to mention that the sample was uh, homogeneous and that it was not racially diverse. So the majority of our participants identified as white heterosexual women. Um, that in consideration, um, I wanna move down. So we also provided the top three reported types of gender-based violence that were experienced by participants during the last 12 months. So see the top reported uh, form of gender-based violence was um, sexual advances, comments, or jokes that were made um, with 71% of bisexual participants and 47% of heterosexual participants reporting experiencing this type of gender-based violence at the University of Utah. And then um, the second most reported type of gender-based violence was being shown or sent sexual pictures, photos, or videos with 73% of bisexual participants and 13% of heterosexual participants reporting this type of gender-based violence. And then the third most reported type of gender-based violence was being pressured to have sexual contact after saying no. Um, and here we had 18% of bisexual participants and 11% of heterosexual participants reporting this type of gender-based violence. So I do wanna take a moment to just, you know, recognize that these are really, really high rates for both bisexual and heterosexual identifying um, sexual gender minority uh, women at the University of Utah. However, if we look, we can see the disparity and this uh, lines up and indicates that possibly um, sexual gender minority women at the University of Utah also experience gender-based violence, especially if they identify as bisexual at disproportionately high rates. Therefore, it merits further research. All right, so since universities with Division I athletic programs, or in other words, larger athletic programs, often experience higher rates of gender-based violence compared to both Division II and Division III universities, or in other words, universities with smaller athletic programs, it is worth noting that Division I universities, such as the Pac-12 universities, are uniquely positioned to address sexual misconduct through more inclusive and effective sexual misconduct policies. So keeping this in mind, we decided to conduct a policy analysis of all PAC-12 primary sexual misconduct policies to compare terminology used among these policies and offer some recommendations. That being said, there are two really significant findings. The first was that none of the PAC-12 universities' primary sexual misconduct policies utilize sexual and gender minority specific terminology, such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, et cetera. Um, additionally, only three of the PAC-12 universities have primary sexual misconduct policies, which address sexual misconduct between people of the same or different sex or gender. These specific universities were the University of Arizona, Arizona State University, and Stanford University. And we think this highlights an opportunity for PAC-12 universities to standardize and improve the inclusion of sexual and gender minority specific terminology to help improve the visibility. All right, so here we have some of the unique risk factors that sexual and gender minority women experience. Um, the first is that they are targeted both by men and by women. Um, there also is this fear of discrimination by service providers such as healthcare and police. Um, for example, there is a 10 year study of arrest rates by police responding to incidents of gender-based violence between intimate partners that was published this year. 
and it found that overall same-sex couples are less likely to result in an arrest if they report. However, they are far more likely to result in the dual arrest of both the abuser and the survivor. So that's saying that sexual and gender minority women who report gender-based violence, either nothing will happen or they risk being arrested along with the abuser, which is a significant barrier um, to accessing services and reporting, which then affects the, um, our ability to collect the rates and really see how big this problem is. And then of course we have the fear of being outed. And what this means, it's a fear of someone um, disclosing your sexual and gender minority status to those who may not be aware. This could be a way to keep you um, in the relationship with the abuser, such as threatening to out you to your place of work or maybe to your, uh, you know, to your religious um, congregation or people who don't know, and they could effectively take away even more of your social supports as well. All right, and then we have some consequences of gender-based violence. Um, the first is an increased risk of substance misuse, for instance, uh, relying on utilizing alcohol as a maladaptive coping skill. Um, there's also an increased risk of HIV or sexually transmitted infections, as well as physical health issues an increased risk of trauma and mental health issues such as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, increased suicidality, to name a few. Um, also risks social isolation and being ostracized, as well as increased risk for and future targeting for gender-based violence. I also wanted to note here quickly that um, gender-based violence between intimate partners has always, has also recently been dubbed a second pandemic by some due to the fact that the survivors experience increased barriers to services and increased isolation during the COVID-19 pandemic. So here we want to briefly touch on heterosexist bias in practice. Um, so what is heterosexist bias? First, it could be simply denying it even exists, saying that I have no bias. You treat everyone the same. So effectively, you're saying that sexual orientation and gender identity don't matter, which is not an equity approach. And then we have a lack of knowledge, lack of training, um, lack of understanding the historical ongoing oppression of medical, psychological, and social service institutions that this population has faced, as well as a lack of awareness of distinct heterogeneity within sexual and gender minority populations, so treating everyone the same, trying to take a one-size-fits-all approach. And then, of course, one of the most significant, in my opinion, would be practice that pathologizes sexual and gender minorities. So trying to diagnose as a disorder or even at the extreme case using problematic, unethical and ineffective modalities such as conversion therapy that are not appropriate. All right, and that being said, I would love to turn things over to Dr. Lisa Grin at this point. Thank you, Bobby. So um, hopefully what we've done is identify for you some areas that um, maybe you can make changes in your approach to working with SGM populations. And there are a variety of resources on these next several slides. Um, so first is to have um, resources that are specific to SGM populations that are available for you to use in your practice, um, both in terms of things you do, but um, in referrals as well. Uh, second would be that from a research and practice context, we need to standardize the collection of information about sexual orienta orientation, gender identity, along with other demographic types of information that we collect, such as race, ethnicity, and age. Um, third, to um, have an educational approach for yourself uh, to learn more about sex and gender minority history, culture, and context. Um, I, I know that coming new to this research area, for me, I had lots of questions. And um, my experience has been that people who identify in an SGM group are very gracious about sharing information to improve my own understanding. And then finally, if someone does come out as being a member of one of these SGM groups to acknowledge that that it contributes to the trust that they have in you and to honor that by um, being um, a good resource and by um, tr showing respect for that person as an individual um, rather than classifying them simply in a demographic category. Charlie, if you'll go ahead, thank you. 
Um, I think we're starting to see a lot more messaging come out. And so um, recognize that that's available to you and take advantage of resources that are provided by um, groups that represent um, sex and gender minority patients or clients. Um, and there are a variety of organizations in our community that you could become connected with um, in order to get that information, get that education for yourself. There are, um, I think, in some of the comments that we heard in our focus groups, this idea about planning for safety, particularly for younger women in, in the research we were doing with college students, many women did not really have a mindset of um, advocating for each other and providing a safety net. And that's something that we could certainly be doing more in our research and practice is teaching those skills and calling out the need to do that. And then I think finally, this idea of normalizing, when we talk about um, gender-based violence or sex and gender minority women, that um, we don't want to think about uh, an us them kind of dichotomy, um, that we wanna have conversations that are open and honest about what people are experiencing and how we can help. Okay, a variety of resources on these next several pages. Um, and I, I don't wanna take a lot of time talking about these, but um, these resources could be available to you and um, we'd encourage you to access them. Charlie, would you mind moving on to the next? Um, I, I don't think I have anything new to say about that, uh, this one either. So let's go ahead to the next slide. These are local resources that I think you may find particularly helpful um, in your work. And so we would uh, recommend them to you as good places to get information, education, um, referral resources, and those kinds of things. And then here on the university campus, um, the Women's Resource Center, the LGBT Resource Center, and the Gender-Based Violence Consortium are all places where you can be learning more about practice as well as research. The last point that I'll leave you with then is that this life course approach is a really important way to think about working with clients. Um, we referenced the um, health equity and promotion model and uh, people are experiencing different individual, social, and community experiences across their life. And so thinking about people as having um, experiences right now that are also colored by things that have happened in the past make them unique. And we want to account for all of that as we approach both research and practice. Um, there are lots of different levels of analysis that we could be thinking about here, all the way from individual up through um, population and health system kinds of levels of analysis. And so uh, it's important to think about when you're looking for resources, at, at what level might you be searching? And, and that will also sort of have impact on depth and breadth. Um, a life course approach also means that you would look at different barriers and different experiences and how they might layer on top of each other and mean that one person who's had a similar experience to another person has a variety of other experiences that color and change how that plays out for them. Um, and this means that we need also to be thinking about concepts like historical trauma, um, discrimination, bias, intersectionality. Those are all terms that um, identify different experiences that people have that may impact how um, they perceive their world and the kinds of health um, issues and actually advantages that they may have. And then um, from a global perspective, I think we need to be aware of the differences in cultural and community settings that may impact how um, gender-based violence and health effects that um, impacts sex and gender minority 
populations may play out in those different settings. Charlie, back to you, I believe. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Drs. Frost and Grin and Bobby Yancey. And now I'm pleased to moderate a discussion with our three wonderful panelists. And right now I'm inviting our guests to share any questions you'd like for us to discuss in the Q&A feature of the uh, Zoom function thingy there. So, so it looks like we have uh, two questions. First one was, what was, were your research questions for this project? And the second is, in what medium was, will the study, will be the study published? Uh, so our, our primary research question was to um, see what gender-based violence looked like specifically in Utah. So um, there's this idea called the Utah paradox. So Utah consistently ranks among the most depressed states or among states with the highest proportion of people living with depression in the United States. And simultaneously, it also uh, typically ranks in the top of states in terms of happiness. So um, what this is suggesting is that uh, in Utah, people are propor uh, proportionately experiencing depression and at the same time are happy. So um, we wanted to see what uh, gender-based violence specifically in Utah regarding uh, sexual and gender minority women. So this is a relatively new area of research. Uh, back earlier in the slides, I showed that um, some research had showed that uh, sexual and gender minority women overall have like 3.7 times the risk for gender-based violence compared to heterosexual women and uh, bisexual women in particular have about two and a half times uh, the risk of gender-based violence. And so we wanted to see if that held here in Utah and our preliminary data seems to suggest that it does. Um, actually, we our amazing team submitted uh, two manuscripts last week. Uh, one was to the Utah Women's uh, Health research, do I have that? Right? It's the Utah Women's Health Review here on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other was to the uh, Journal of College Health. Is that correct, Bobby? So that was the, the uh, Journal of American College Health, I believe. Journal of American College Health. So that was the one that was based on our policy analysis of the uh, PAC-12 uh, universities. Uh, we have another question. How would you help a young teen realize that he has been sexually abused by an adult when he thinks of the experience as his way of coming out? Would any of you want to address that? I would start out by having the conversation about what gender-based violence is. Um, because a lot of times people can avoid that and then this turns into something that is minimized and can be incorporated as like a maladaptive kind of way of exploring your sexual, you know, uh, journey. Um, but personally, I would frankly have a conversation and maybe find other teens that could maybe have this conversation with them. Um, that would be my first thought to just normalize and acknowledge that this, you know, could possibly be you know, gender, you know, sexual violence. So, thanks, Bobby. So our next question is, is the U of U student body valid to all of Utah? Uh, great question. Short answer is no, it's not. But uh, I think the first slide following Benjamin Disraeli, uh, that data was from the Utah Behavioral Risk, Risk Factor Surveillance System. Uh, which as Bobby pointed out is quite a mouthful. So we call it the BRFIS. And that is uh, population-based representative data. And so we can generalize that uh, in Utah. Uh, we are working on that manuscript for publication right now also. Uh, we also have a question curious about the health equity promotion model and if an economic dimension was intentionally excluded. 
without it, the role that economic well being and or poverty plays in health outcomes is omitted from the conversation. Uh, we did not specifically exclude that uh, in all of our analyses uh, using this particular framework. We consistently control for um, age, race, ethnicity, uh, education, and income. Uh, this uh, model, we developed it back in 2014. And so I think this is a great suggestion for us to revisit that and think about um, maybe explicitly including that in the model. So thank you for that question. Any other questions? Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Yeah, I'm just gonna raise a question. Okay, because I am not a practitioner, okay? Um, so, you know, Bobby, I think you started to answer this question, you know, about, you know, beginning the conversation, right? So how do you continue the conversation with someone, right? Not necessarily that they have experienced gender-based violence, but, you know, is there a potential in their life for this? How, how do you help them walk through that process and help them to manage and access the various resources? And either Charlie or Bobby can answer that. It's good. Uh, could you repeat that, Karen? Maybe. Okay. So as you're thinking, as you're thinking about working with clients, right? Because you know, actually, Dr. Grant and I are neither one of us practitioners, right? Um, and thinking about how you move somebody through the process of this discussion. I mean, maybe it's about gender-based violence. And maybe it starts, you know, as, you know, talking about sexual and gender minorities and what they may experience and how do you sort of get that, engage them in that conversation? And then also to make sure, you know, that they access the resources that are available to them. Because as we saw, there are a lot of resources that are available to people. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I, uh, I think it's a good thing to, be constantly adding to and expanding uh, individual practitioners uh, resource library, so to speak. This is also an area where um, it can get very tricky. Um, and part of that is based on um, uh, dominant discourses. So uh, many years ago, I was living in Portland and um, there was a case that made state headlines. Uh, mother walked in to her son's 10 year old and 12 year old son's bedrooms and they were doing what 10 and 12 year olds sometimes do, which was exploring, playing around, so to speak. And uh, she actually had her 12 year old son arrested and charged with um, uh, child abuse. Um, it got really ugly. Um, I'm not clear about the context of the original person's question. It, it, what I was interpreting was that um, uh, a young person, I'm assuming an adolescent, had a sexual experience with another person and considered that as coming out or part of their coming out process. Um, so, these laws vary by state and typically um, for people who are under 18, um, and I'd have to go look, look at the exact language in Utah, but typically if there's no more than two or three years difference in age among people who are under the age of 18, if it's consensual, um, then it's not illegal. Um, if it's someone over the age of 18 years, uh, then it is illegal and it's statutorily non-consensual. And I think this is a would be a great place to um, further educate oneself. So there are uh, different um, models of sexual and gender minority identity development. So different um, transitional phases that people go through from uh, um, recognizing their assumptive heterosexual identity is maybe no longer valid. And um, because of the way 
uh, information is controlled in some settings. Uh, sometimes the only way that young people can get information is outside of normal channels. But um, I would definitely uh, encourage you to um, further educate yourselves around. Um, so we, you know, we suggested um, educating yourself around historical, cultural aspects of SGM community and culture. Um, also, uh, I would include with that uh, the development of other um, understandings. So, for example, until uh, with the first edition of the DSM in 1952, homosexuality, which at that point was not differentiated from gender identity and was just an umbrella term, was by definition a sociopathic personality disturbance. So just the fact that you were gay uh, meant that you were psychopathic, psychopathically disturbed. In 1973, that changed uh, somewhat, and it was only a psychological illness if you were actually distressed by your sexual orientation. Uh, that didn't actually finally get removed until the 1980s, and that's when gender identity was differentiated from homosexuality or same-sex orientations and identities. Um, and then with the release of the DSM-5 back in 2013, that seems to be mirroring exactly what happened with the DSM and homosexuality throughout the latter half of the 20th century. So now, um, Having a transgender or non-binary identity in and of itself is not a psychiatric disorder, but if it causes you clinically significant distress, it is a psychiatric disorder. And the only way that you can legally obtain gender affirming medical care is to have a licensed psychologist or clinical social worker diagnose you with a psychiatric disorder that will stay on your record for the rest of your life. So it's um, it's kind of a balancing act. Uh, so a lot of it is uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, uh, it's going to be how you educate yourself and what materials uh, you seek out. Did that help? Yeah, that, that, I thought that was great. Could I add on just a little bit? Because sure. that kind of stirred something for me. Um, I was thinking back, so in my program, I had the opportunity in my qualitative class to interview um, sexual and gender minority women who had experienced um, gender-based violence. And one of the themes that came up is an inability to name gender-based violence because they couldn't even name what a healthy same-sex relationship was because that wasn't even modeled. So I, I think we can't have one of these without the other, right? So I think it'd be important not only to, to just have representation, like give our pronouns, maybe a, a flag, whatever you can to show it's a safe space, but also to talk about what, a, what is a healthy relationship for sexual and gender minorities? And what does that look like as opposed to the stereotypes we often see in the media? So can I add to that too? And I know we have two questions in the, in the, in the question thing, um, but you know, um, based on the conversations that we had with the community, women and as well as the university women, that is that's, that is a real thing. You can't even name it. And sometimes in the lesbian community, and this was talked about in the focus groups we had with people, it's hidden. And so it's not even discussed in a public forum and people are not even, they are unaware that it even happens to lesbian women. So it was, it, it's a whole, it's a whole conversation that, you know, that silence piece, silence is a killer. Right. So and, and how do we then push that forward so people know it can happen everywhere? Right. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, both Bobby and Karen. It's uh, it's really helpful information. Uh, Charlie, I think that leads into our, the next question, which is what additional research are we interested in? And I, I think we have a really strong preventive lens that we are thinking about in our research team, and that is that for um, women in college or women of college age, there is an inability to, to identify what's healthy, uh, to put names to behaviors, um, to prevent, to provide the social support network. And that's where our team is particularly interested in going is to look at implementation steps that could happen that would help 
women in this age group to um, better equip themselves to prevent gender-based violence. One of the differences that we sort of noted between women from the community who were a little bit older and from our college students is that this idea of advocating for each other and watching out for each other and stepping in to intervene um, to prevent violence. That was a missing piece for younger women. And that's something that we think we could certainly um, do something about. And so that's an area of interest for us. But in terms of that spectrum of research, um, one of the quotes early on in the slide was that there's discovery research and there's implementation research. And I think both need to have an, a lens applied that says, not everybody's exactly the same. And we need to look at those differences across the spectrum to see what are the differences? What's the discovery piece we need? And in terms of implementation, how do we do so in a way that fits for the community that we're addressing? Again, trying to move away a little bit from this one size fits all approach in research and practice. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grin. And you know, one piece I'd like to add to that, the discovery piece. So um, I went into my doctoral program specifically focused on the issue of mental health disparities among sexual and gender minority midlife and older adults. Um, <clears throat> and what was guiding my research at that time was the uh, minority stress model, which we've um, built upon that and incorporated a life course perspective when we developed our health equity promotion model. But we can know that there's, um, uh, disparities in health outcomes. So for example, depression, but we need to know what's going on inside the black box that's transmuting that social stigma and experience into uh, health disparities. And so one of the things that um, I did with my dissertation research was show that uh, long-term concealment of sexual or gender identity uh, is actually a chronic stressor and that the internalization of uh, social stigma around non-heterosexuality is also a chronic stressor. And so those two factors, both directly and indirectly, uh, increase the risk for depression as well as uh, stress-related chronic health conditions. And so we can know that um, for example, bisexual women experience two and a half times greater risk for gender-based violence than heterosexual women. But what's going on inside that black box that's operating to um, magnify uh, that disparity in being targeted for gender-based violence? And as Dr. Grin was pointing out, that will then uh, help us better focus and target um, the implementation type of research. So can I just add to that piece? Okay. <laughs> this, I'm sorry, but this is what our research team meetings are like on Friday. We, we get into these discussions and they're just so wonderful to have. Um, so one of the things that I, I think that you're sort of all talking about here oh. is that, you know, the, 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 the silence piece, but also I don't know what I should do if this, if I see this happening, or I don't know what I should do to prevent this from happening. Because when we talk to the, um, the women on campus and ask the question, what do you do to prevent this for, for other women? There was silence. Okay. So the, the idea that you would be thinking about prevention activities, not just for yourself, but for other people was just simply lacking, which I think really speaks to one of the components of being socially isolated, right? I don't know who to talk to, and I, I, I'm not sure, I don't know how to manage that kind of thing. So um, I just wanted to put that out there because I, you know, Jen has a question here about, you know, what about the impact of social isolation, right? And I, and I think it's, it's clear from some of the conversations we're having with people um, that they don't, they don't know where to go. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Frost, and just a really quick bullet point to add to that. Uh, there's lots of um, 
uh, research around, so been a lot of research around social isolation. And uh, social isolation is associated with um, premature illness and premature death. Uh, it's also been likened to having as negative effect on our bodies as smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. Um, and when you think about already being isolated, uh, potentially being socially isolated because of one's sexual orientation or gender identity, and then if you had that piece of gender-based violence where someone may be even more socially isolated, um, then, uh, then it just compounds each other. And I see here a note that um, Emily would like to answer this question live. Did I miss something there? Um, there also was a question. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, um, I was just going to say, I'm just marking it that you're answering it live because you guys are covering it. So you're good. Keep going. Okay. These things pop up in the Q&A for us that you all don't see. And I'm like, oh, what should I do with that? OK. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Emily. That's great. Uh, any suggestions for meso or macro type social works that address gender based violence? Uh, you can become a U.S. senator. You can uh, seriously. Um, there are lots of community organizations, agencies, programs, initiatives, and directives uh, that are addressing gender-based violence. So at the University of Utah, there's the Gender-Based Violence Consortium. Uh, there's the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition. Uh, one of the slides showed, um, I forget uh, what they call it, but it's from the uh, Northwest Network in Seattle and the Northwest Network is an agency with programming that specifically addresses gender-based violence in the SGM community. Uh, there's the Rape Recovery Center, um, all kinds of different places where you can uh, get into meso or macro type social work jobs. Uh, also doing research, so like the research that we're doing, um, I would consider that to be meso to macro social work also because the research that uh, we are uh, uncovering and developing is used to impact and influence the development of policies, uh, programs, and things like that. So really great questions. This is really, really cool. Any other questions? I did want to mention too, just as a resource, I was looking through today online and saw that um, I think it's uh, Equality Utah um, specifically offers um, a free training for organizations to help with inclusion and diversity trainings around um, you know, sexual and gender minorities just as a starting point. So that's a great resource if you're interested in just starting with your organization to, to begin this conversation. Thanks, Bobby. Um, there's also, it's also in one of the slides, it's the uh, LGBTQ Affirming Therapist Guild of Utah. And uh, typically throughout the year, um, I think it's like, uh, like the third Thursday of the month or something like that, they do in-service trainings around different issues. So one of the ones that's coming up, for example, is uh, working with uh, transgender individuals who uh, are somewhere on the autism spectrum. Uh, and they have lots of, uh, lots of different ones. There's also the, um, oh, what's the big gender conference in November, I think it is, um, gender equity, something like that. Uh, but anyway, these uh, trainings that the <clears throat> Therapist Guild puts on, uh, they actually also offer CEUs and things like that. So it's very on very hands-on practice-oriented uh, types of trainings. So Charlie, your comment just made me think, you know, one of the things that we didn't even uncover or even talk about in here is um, people who have disabilities, right? So mm -hmm. what, how is that? There's another piece there that we aren't, we, we didn't even get into in our research because uh, I don't think we actually asked the question. 
And um, I, I don't think there's a lot of research out there about that either. So um, I, I think that's a really interesting. See, there are so many topics here for dissertations or theses. All you have to do is ask and you'll come up with one. But I, I, yeah, I, you know, I hadn't even thought about that, which tells you how narrow I am on my thinking. Well, I, I don't know that um, it's that narrow type of thinking, Karen. Uh, because I'm now feeling kind of guilty. Back when I was at the University of Washington, I attended a conference and they actually had a special um, presentation on sexuality among people with uh, disabilities and introducing things that it never even occurred to me um, to even to even think about. And so that shows that you know my own uh, limitations in terms of my uh, ableist privilege and things like that. So um, that's that's a very important thing to point out. Thank you. Uh, let's see, so it looks like the Center for Student Wellness has a victim survivor advocacy program uh, that works with students, faculty, and staff at the U who have experienced and with partner violence, uh, also have um, uh, other types of things. So. Thank you for sharing that, Ellie Goldberg. Ellie's one of our former students. Hey, Ellie. Of course. Cool. Um, anything else that we want to um, play badminton with? Sure. I was thinking of being a clinician and resources in the community specific, um, and how a lot of times it, it's important that we also act as a gatekeeper. Um, because a lot of the existing resources um, are predominantly for cisgender survivors uh, that identify as women. Um, so if I have maybe a trans woman of color who identifies as bisexual who just experienced gender-based violence, I may want to call ahead just to make sure that that identity would be honored and would be a good fit for this person before I refer them. So just something to always think of um, since we're wanting to be more not, more nuanced and not take that kind of one size fits all approach. Good point, Bobby. Thank you for that. So there's a question here about what results surprised us about our research. I can hop in on that one for a minute. Good. Um, there were a couple of things that I found surprising. Um, the first was when we did the policy analysis of PAC-12 universities, um, I think over the last couple of years with so much attention being paid to equity and justice, I was surprised how many of these policies seem to be old and outdated and use language that we would not consider um, inclusive anymore. And so um, it, it, it speaks to how entrenched some of this could feel to a uh, a person who identifies in an SGM group because we're still living with old language. Um, so, so that was a little bit surprising to me because I always think of universities as kind of being at the forefront and we're not on this issue. Um, I think the other thing that I found really surprising was this idea that um, young women feel at a loss as to how to change this for themselves and for others and that there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done in this area, both in terms of research, why is that? But um, also in terms of implementation, how do we give people the tools to feel safe and to um, manage their own risk um, and support others as well? And so those were, I think, the two kind of ahas for me in this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to echo that, especially that second one. So I had just come out of participating in a training at, um, it, it for a, it, with a group in New York called the Center Against Violence. I think that's what it's called. Anyway, and they were talking about upstander training and um, that kind of thing. And they were going through, here's a scenario. And what would you do? Okay, um, so somebody's in trouble, right? Somebody's walking across the street. This woman is being harassed by men behind her. She's being called names. They're saying terrible things to her. What would you, if, especially if you and your friends were walking along, what would you do? And invariably, these people are all 
honestly, 40 years younger than I am. Okay, um, let's, let's put that out there. And they all said, I don't think I'd do anything because I wouldn't want to tackle those men. It's like, okay, take your focus off of this threat. Take your focus on what you can do for her. Okay, so I said, what if you said to your friend something like, hey, let's just call out her name, like a name and walk over and scoop her up, incorporate her into the group and walk on down the street. And they were like, oh, that is so smart. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So the, the, the lack of figuring out an effective solution where you're not putting yourself at risk, right? It's just, it's just, it's just not there. So how do we help people to develop that? And I think, yeah, from our research and from this other context, I absolutely agree with what Dr. Grin said. It, 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 they're, they're, this is just not there for them. Um, yeah, there was a story just yesterday or the day before a woman was being raped on a train and a bunch of bystanders um, videotaped it on their phones, but no one called 911. So, <clears throat> um, unfortunately for me, I don't think anything so far really surprised me about the study. Um, I've been doing research on sexual and gender minorities. Um, next year will literally be 20 years. Um, and it's it's one of those things that um, it's, it's really subtle, but there's um, a cultural and implicit bias. So when we think about straight people, the first thing that typically comes to our mind is not what they're doing under the sheets or who they're doing it with. It's, you know, children and families and things like that. But sexual and gender minority populations and identities are inherently sexualized and have been since the beginning of the late 19th, uh, beginning of the early 20th century. Um, where I've particularly seen changes over time, uh, I think there's three that immediately come to mind. Uh, one is the recognition of the quote, heterogeneity among sexual and gender minority populations. So um, initially most research done with LGBTQ people was done with middle-class white men, white gay white men. Um, gradually that began to be recognized. And so then we started, um, and by we, I mean the research field writ large, uh, started focusing more on lesbian people, lesbian women. Um, lots of research would use LGBT acronyms, but it you very rarely um, incorporated the B and the T, the bisexual and the transgender. Uh, up until very recently, um, I'd say within the last four years, um, the proportion of people who self-identified as bisexual was actually very minuscule. And we knew that there was this uh, phenomenon called biphobia and transphobia. I'm gonna stick with biphobia just for a moment. Um, so bisexual people in the larger culture um, experience heterosexism, heterosexist bias around their bisexuality within sexual and gender minority communities, uh, bisexual people have historically experienced biphobia uh, from uh, primarily lesbians and gay men. And that that's not a legitimate sexual orientation. Uh, you're just trying it out, things like that. Sometime over the last two to four years, that whole paradigm just turned upside down. And now, um, research, both state and national level research shows that more people actually identify as bisexual than they do as lesbian or gay. Uh, so that's one big area of difference. Um, the other is that um, a shift from recognizing that the cause of the cause of the social determinants of these, for example, um, elevated rates of gender-based violence, mental health issues, suicidality, substance use issues. That's not because people are sexual and gender minorities. It's because of the heterosexist, cisgender, heteronormative society that we live in. And so that it's that social stigma that gets 
internalized and embedded under the skin to result in these health disparities. So it's, um, it's an area that's gained more respectability, whatever that means. And now, um, you know, one positive turn that I'm seeing uh, these last couple of years is probably for the last at least good 15 years, we've been looking at the negative aspects of sexual orientation and gender identity. So these mental health disparities, things like that. But more recently, we're starting to focus on resilience and things like that. And I think that's very important uh, in terms of moving, moving the research forward. Uh, so what are the rates of gender-based violence between intimate partners? And how does that compare to intimate partner violence rates across the board? Um, do you want to take that one, Bobby? Sure. Um, so my understanding of what I've seen with intimate partner violence is the trends are pretty similar. Um, um, okay, let me say first, the only thing we can really say is that um, sexual and gender minorities experience intimate partner violence at the same or higher rates than um, their heterosexual counterparts um, because of the methodology and the surveys that currently exist. However, one of the most recent um, national surveys, which was the 2010, I think, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey um, did find that it was around 43% of women identified as lesbian um, reported lifetime intimate partner violence, um, and 61% of women identified as bisexual experienced this compared to 35% of heterosexual women. So the trends are similar in that it seems like uh, sexual gender minority women who identify as bisexual run kind of a higher risk of experiencing these forms. Um, I would, I would gather to say that those identify as transgender folks would also have an increased risk, but I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Bobby. I think the, um, and I don't remember off the top of my head, the uh, national or the U.S. Transgender Survey, uh, which was conducted in 2015. I think the first publications off of that came out in 2016. And I think it's something, it's, it's an incredible number. I know it's greater than 50% of transgender people have, ex, have been targeted for gender-based violence. I think it may actually be approaching 70 or 80% of uh, transgender, gender non-binary people being targeted for uh, gender-based violence. One of the challenges, particularly with um, uh, transgender of research with transgender and non-binary populations is that very, very few um, population-based uh, data sets actually ask questions about gender identity. Uh, Utah, to its credit, last year for the very first time, it's been collecting uh, questions about sexual orientation since 2011 in the BRFIS. But last year was the first time they uh, asked a question about gender identity. And so um, there is a movement towards including these questions as standards, uh, but we're still a long way from there. So a lot of the uh, research that's out there is based on community-based samples. Um, and while that provides important information, it's um, really pro problematic to be able to generalize from community-based samples to the general population. Okay. Um, so we, have a, we have a question, a comment, and a question in the chat. Oh, we do. Yeah. So um, it says, hearing about the young women who are at a loss as to how to help support other LGBTQ plus women is that common to those in their age group regardless of gender and sexual orientation? Or does this seem to be unique or a greater problem for LGBTQ plus individuals than for heterosexual individuals? Um, you know, just any thoughts about that? I, 
would start off with, I mean, traditionally the conceptualization of, yeah, for me, it's intimate partner violence, um, but it's traditionally, right, a feminist uh, perspective with men perpetrating against women to control them, which is completely legit and definitely needed. However, applying that to sexual gender minority women, there's this uh, myth of the lesbian utopia, um, which uses that theory to say that a relationship with two women absent a man to try to control a woman would be absent of violence. So I, I think historically there is internalized heterosexism that has probably fed to this issue um, mm -hmm. based off of that. But Charlie, do you, you have something to add? Um, no, I was um, trying to remember. Uh, it seemed like it was um, the women at the university who were more at a loss of uh, how to help support other women around issues of gender-based violence. And as I recall, uh, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully I'm recalling accurately, um, women who participated in our study that were more community-based, uh, so like from the Utah Pride Center, things like that, actually has, um, uh, they had some very good solid ideas uh, around how to support other sexual and gender minority women. So. I'm not sure it may be um, an artifact of different samples, uh, could be an artifact of where they're at in terms of their um, uh, educational development, community identity development, uh, different things like that. So that's a, that's a tough question to ask, uh, to answer. Uh, you wanna talk about the dream house, Karen? Oh, sure. Okay, so there's a book called In the Dream House, um, and it is about, um, it, it's considered a, a gothic memoir, actually, because when we think about gothic works, there's, there's a damsel in distress, there's a haunted house of some type, um, there's a domineering man, okay, in some way, but in this, it's a lesbian relationship where um, they're building their dream house and, and trying to work on their relationship. But one of the partners who is never named in the book is very abusive. But the woman who wrote the book didn't even know this happened to lesbian couples, okay? Anyway, I highly recommend it as a book. It, 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 it talks about a number of these issues. Um, hopefully um, we are um, gonna be embark in November on a commentary on this and how to use this type of work in social work education. Um, so anyway, I highly recommend it. It, it. It's an accessible text once you get past the strangeness of the chapters. I mean, I think we're used to chapters being, you know, four or five, 10 pages. Sometimes there are two sentences in this book. So anyway, it, it's a wonderful book, but it highlights many of the things that we're talking about here and what we've seen in our research. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. I am now going to have to go out and get the book. Okay, um, it looks like we have about one minute left. So I want to thank everyone involved. Um, I want to thank our highly respected guests, Dr. Karen Frost, Dr. Elisa Grin, and Bobby Yancey, as well as Diana Powell, who unfortunately was not able to join us today for their time here today and for their impactful service on this critical issue. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, and those who continue to support our emergency student fund through programs such as this. The College of Social Work is committed to the speaker series as part of our effort to address the grand challenges of social work, which are truly grand challenges for our communities. We hope you'll continue to join us in the spring semester as we continue to explore the solutions to these important challenges. Please visit the college's events page for information on all of our events. Good afternoon to everyone. Stay safe and be cool. <laughs> <laughs>